how are you tonight? I'm good, thank you, man. I'm I'm excited to finally come back to Thailand soon. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. We're we're we got things going, you know. So, oh, yeah. It's it's been exciting watching your posts and like. I think I followed you even before you came to Thailand, and you're kind of one of the people that I'm really glad has came to Thailand. Well, you know, the thing that bothers me the most is I hear way too much about how the Thai genetics are crap from people all the time, and that bothers me. It bothers me greatly because I know that's not true, you know, and that's where I start, you know. I can talk, start talking, you know. I started smoking my first time in 1974. We, I was 12 years old. You, way Are you ready for me to start talking? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready, man. I was going to say, you, you were smoking before I was even a twinkle in my mother's eye. <laughs> oh, yeah. 1974 is when I first, me and my friend smoked a joint and joints of Acapulco Gold that we got for 50 cents each. And basically, that was my first experience. Um, I grew up on a farm. Uh, you know, we were always raising animals, had big gardens. So when we first started getting cannabis, you know, back then it was all land race coming out of Mexico, Central America. Later in the 70s is when the Colombians started to come in more. So when I first started smoking, it was just pretty much Acapulco Gold and Oaxacan and things like that. But it was all loaded with seed. So, you know, first thing we did is, hey, if there's seed, let's grow it. So, you know, here we are 12, 13 years old, and we were growing the Landrace sativa seed that we were pulling off the Acapulco gold and all the strains we were getting. And basically, I was in Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota in the U.S., which is in northern climates. And at that point in time, we were young. We had no idea that here we are trying to flower out a sativa-dominant plant in a northern environment where we have frost and snow coming at us in September. And, you know, it just doesn't work too well. But we always tried. We always had fairly nice big plants. They never matured, anything like that. Um, so basically started smoking young in the, the 70s, selling tie sticks. I had very good connections. Uh, in the 80s, moved to California, started was part of the, the hybridization of the plant in the 80s. Uh, I can talk about the seed catalogs that we had gotten out of the back of the High Times magazine. We all would basically send one money, money order to Amsterdam. The seeds would go to Minnesota or an alternate location, then sent to us in California to always try to cut the tie off that seed. And we knew that if we were bringing seed in from Amsterdam, we always tried to cut the tie to the grows out in California. So we would always have them sent into the Midwest and then basically forwarded to us in California. So that way we didn't have any issues with the DEA following the seed, which they did back in that time. And basically, I was a part of the whole hybridization, moved to Texas 2012. Colorado started talking about legalization, caught my attention, and I went to Colorado. And I was part of the first legalization in 2013. And I went to Colorado with the ambition to start a CBD company. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the Stanley brothers were already in, Char in Colorado Springs. They were developing the Charlotte's Web. Uh, they were bringing a big awareness to CBD technology. And basically at that time, it opened the door and... I had a good friend that I met that was in Denver. Her name is Dr. Michelle Ross. Uh, her specialty is human addiction, but through that, she did know the human endocannabinoid system very well. So she was in Colorado helping transition the kids that were coming to Colorado for CBD technology because there were two issues that we had to deal with. The first issue bringing kids into Colorado, we're bringing them up into high elevation, we had to get them acclimated to the elevation. Then the biggest step that they had to do was basically get them off of pharmaceutical drugs so that they could get them onto CBD-administered cannabinoids and, and things that they were trying to use for fighting grandma seizures and those types of items. So she was a big part of transitioning those kids into Colorado to get them into the medical marijuana system because there was still that big issue. We were bringing kids in under 18 that we then were administering cannabinoids to. And, you know, 
there's a whole mystique with that whole thing. Mm-hmm. So at that point in time, I started a company called Patriot CBD. And I was one of the first people that were selling CBDs. Uh, I had a full integrated website. Um, basically set up PayPal, Square, Wells Fargo set up bank accounts for my company. And within six months, I had been selling hemp-derived CBD product on my website. The first thing that happened was PayPal uh, confiscated $164 because they said it was from a, an illicit sale that I had made on their platform and actually banned me for life because of that. And it was CBD oil, hemp-derived, that was totally legal at that point in time. Yeah. <laughs> and I have never got that $164 back from PayPal. They flat out took it from me. They banned me for life from their platform. And then within about four weeks, Wells Fargo shut down my business account for Patriot CBD. So at that point, I lost PayPal. Square then came in, shut us all down. So I didn't have any platforms to process money via credit card or PayPal. So I had a fully integrated website with no bank support or any type of financial support through the credit card people or anything like that because at that point in time they waged war on all of us in 2014 and when I started my company I developed the name Patriot CBD off of the thoughts of being in the United States bringing CBD technology had the URL everything going I was one of the first people that got nailed because of the fact that I had CBD in my name and they went after anybody that had CBD in the name. They shut down all my accounts and basically destroyed my business. Uh, we had actually struggled at first because when we first started CBD businesses in Colorado, it was off of isolate coming in from China. We found very quickly that a lot of the isolate that was coming in was contaminated with heavy metals and things like that. So within one year, the hemp people in, in Colorado had actually cranked it up and started developing isolates and things like that to where within one, one year we had local support for making of our oils. We were making all kinds of things that we were basically using the Colorado derived hemp CBD for and it got us going. But because of the fact that my company had gotten destroyed, I basically had to shut my website down. And shortly after that, I was an avid hiker in Colorado. I hiked every weekend, high elevation with a group. It was called the Front Range Singles. We did 10 miles every weekend, always above 10,000 feet. Uh, we had done a hike on June 14th. We did an 11-mile hike. And basically on June 14th, I think it was, Father's Day, I decided to climb what was called the Manitou Incline in Colorado Springs. It is an old rail grade that is 2,000 feet of elevation over 1.1 miles. So it's basically like the stairway to heaven. And for some crazy reason, it was 90 degrees out. I had done 11 miles with a full pack the day before. I woke up and said, I'm going to do the Manitou Incline today with a full pack. And I put my pack on, started up the mountain. I made it halfway up and had a heart attack. And it was actually my second heart attack. I had had one prior in 2012. So I knew instantly when I had it, but uh, what had happened, um, I had to assess the situation. There are typically three to four people that die up on the Manitou incline every year because of heart attacks. Um, once you get up, it's nearly impossible for them to get you down off the mountain. I was over halfway up. Um, I sat down, I have pictures of this, I ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I had made for myself, I had a heart attack, I knew I was suffering, I drank water, I basically went down the incline, which at that point in time you could not, you weren't supposed to go down the incline. I went down and it took me four hours to get down the incline, I for some reason did not stop when I got to the bottom. We know that it's because my blood oxygen level was so low and I actually hiked another mile and a half to my car. I basically got in my car. I drove myself home, changed my hiking clothes into a Bob Marley shirt and put on my stoner clothes and drove myself to the hospital. And it took me almost five hours at that point. I walked into the emergency room, told the ladies that I was having a heart attack. 
And she kind of jokingly said, oh, you're at the right hospital. And I said, no, I'm having a attack right now. They put the EKJs on me. At that point in time, my blood oxygen level was at 18%. And basically what had happened, I had had a prior heart attack. Uh, my health care got taken away from me in the United States from my employer. So I could not uh, afford my prescription medications. So my prescription medications were being bought for me out of Mexico. And come to find out now, the medication that was being bought for me out of Mexico was no good. It was basically pseudo. And when I left Texas, I was in prime condition. My heart was good. We had done an echocardiogram within one year because I was taking what I thought were meds that weren't. The plaque had built up in the two stints they put in. And basically what had happened, uh, the two stints plugged up and what caused the heart attack. By the time I got to the hospital, my heart was at 19% infraction rate. And, and that has to do with measuring how much damage is done to the heart. And anything under 20% infraction rate, you are automatically put on the heart transplant list. My blood oxygen level was at 18%. I was driving a car. I was still conscious. They do not know how I even made it to that point. Uh, they put me on a stretcher. And basically, I had a nurse. And it was the craziest thing. I had a nurse just staring into my eyes, screaming at me about how, how could I be driving that car when I was in that condition? Did I realize how many people I could have killed driving that car? And she just was staring deep into my soul. And she was just yelling at me this whole time. They got me into the emergency room. They called my mother on the phone. And basically, all I said was, I'm having a heart attack. And I honestly threw the phone. And that's the last I remember. Uh, the next, I woke up in intensive care. Uh, they had to put in what was called a balloon pump. The nurse then was staring me in the eyes. She said, you need to understand right now, you have uh, basically in your uh, artery is... Uh, it's about the size of a knife, 18 inches long. If you sit up, if you cough, anything, that will puncture your artery. I, you will bleed out before I can get into the room. And she said, so you have two options. Either I can tie you to bed right now, or you have to stay still for the next three or four days. So I opted to have her tie me to the bed, which she did. She completely tied me down to the bed, which it took three days for them to get my blood oxygen level back up so that they could release me out of intensive care. They kept me alive for three days on a balloon pump. And at that point, when they let me out, we assessed the situation. They said in 90 days, we will look. I was automatically on the heart transplant list at that point. And they basically were going to reassess 90 days after my first echocardiogram. Um, after seven days in the hospital, when I left, I was wearing what was called a life vest. It was a portable defibrillator that I wore 24 hours a day, that I was always in contact with somebody in case my heart went into AFib. They could shock me no matter where I was. And I wore it for 90 days. And basically, we had a fight when I was in the hospital because I had a big knot in the back. And I looked at the cardiologist and I told him that I wanted some edibles. I wanted medical marijuana. And I had my medical marijuana card in my wallet. And he looked right at me and said, that medical marijuana card is nothing. It was not given to you by a doctor. It's not real medicine. And I honestly looked straight at the nurse. And I asked her if she knew what a grand mal seizure was. And she said yes. And I asked her if she knew what CBDs were. And she said no. And I looked right at her in the eye and I said, I think you need to go out on your computer and do a little bit of research on Google right now. You're in Colorado Springs. And the fact that you do not know what CBDs are and, and how they will fight a grand mal seizure. Uh, and I thought, I looked straight at the doctor. I told him I would not take his opiates, that if he put an opiate in me, that I would get him because of the fact that he would not allow me to have medical marijuana while I was in the hospital and I was licensed for it. So the day I left the hospital, my caregiver actually gave me at that point in time what was called angel tears in Colorado. It was basically full extract cannabis oil, eco, and she gave it to me for a year and a half, told me that it was my meds, 
and gifted it to me. This was $50 bottles, and I took it regimentally every day. Um, after I got out of the hospital, I had already been growing high CBD strains. I was smoking high CBD. The day I got out, they told me I shouldn't do anything like that. I was smoking high CBD mango haze the day I got out of the hospital and didn't ever stop. Uh, I basically got on my feet. I w was doing a mile and a half to two miles every day, hiking cannabinoids, hiking cannabinoids. 90 days went back in. Basically, we had agreed if I could get my infraction rate up two points, up to 21 it would get me off the heart transplant list, and then we would basically discuss putting in a pacemaker. At 90 days, let me step back, we filed for full disability. The first week I was in the hospital, we filed for full disability. They told me I would never work again in my life. They told me I would never hike again in my life. They were mad that I had not called the ambulance when I got to the bottom of the incline that day. The doctors were not happy with me. We had not been getting along because I was fighting them about cannabis. And basically at that point when I left the hospital, uh, they told me 90 days come back. We do an echo. We assess and we'll talk about the pacemaker. So I'll full, full disability at 90 days when I went back in, my first echocardiogram came back in at 48%. And the cardiologist put on my medical records, astonishing recovery. And that was after 90 days. And I asked him, straight to the end of his eye, what created this astonishing recovery? And he would not answer that question. And it took me three years to fight that full, that disability claim because it was a, we were going for full disability. The government kept going back to his comment at 90 days about astonishing recovery. And after three years and three denials for my disability claim, the government denied it because of the fact that prior to my heart attack, I had been working for a company called Grasshopper. And we were going out to big cannabis grows and trimming or crews of 30 and 40 of us that would go to these massive grows in Pueblo and trim for days and do nothing but trim, trim, trim. They were taking, because we were a staffing agency, at that point in time, they were the only people that were able to take taxes out and pay us like normal. Anybody that was working in a dispensary at that point, it was strictly cash only. We were being paid cash basically at the end of the night. And I tell everybody, in 2014, 7-Eleven in Colorado was the largest launder of cannabis money out of anybody in the whole state of Colorado. The dispensaries at the end of the night would take all the money that they collected that day, go straight to 7-Eleven, convert it to money orders because that's the only thing they could do with that money. They couldn't put it in the banks because the banks wouldn't take their money. They didn't want to take it home and stash it away. So most people as in the dispensary owners would go to 7-Eleven at the end of the night and take their money. And if they owed suppliers, they would have basically a money order cut for the supplier for the amount they owed them and convert that cannabis money into money orders at 7-Eleven so that we could use that money and not have to stick it underneath our mattresses. And that's because all of us in the cannabis industry in 2014 in Colorado got destroyed. We didn't have bank accounts. We had to live cash-only lives, and it made things kind of difficult in a lot of situations. Uh, but it was one of those where we adapted, and we did what we had to do at that point in time. Uh, at that times when the Stanley Brothers with the Charlotte's Web CBD awareness and our big thing at that point was trying to get people to understand that every human being has an endocannabinoid system and they need to understand the endocannabinoid system is basically a CB1 and a CB2 receptor and the CB1 receptor will take THC the CBD CB2 two receptor will accept CBD. And when they talk about the entourage effect with cannabis when it's used medicinally, think about the fact you have THC, CBD, they connect to each receptor. They create a complete circuit at that point, which on the endocannabinoid system is the, the best way to use because there's a discussion of if we're just using CBD isolate and there's no THC involved with CBD isolate, 
are people truly getting what they need out of the cannabinoid? And we did find. I had patients that I was working with in Colorado. I had a gentleman that had prostate cancer. Um, he came to Colorado. We were treating him with 30 milligrams of THC every day. He did not want to get high. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Let me back it up. 30 milligrams of CBD every day. He did not want to get high. So we were taking a 10 milligram gummy bear and cutting it in half. And he was taking 5 milligrams in the morning when he got up. And then he was taking 5 milligrams at night before he went to bed. So at 5 milligrams, after a day or two of taking that low dose of cannabinoids, you don't feel it at all. And it doesn't affect you at work. And it's one of those where there's another issue that we really want to get across to people and the fact that I'm the first one that will say, I have, have handfuls of pharmaceutical drugs that were given to me by the doctors that I have to take every day. And every one of those bottles say that I should not be driving a car while I take those medications. But guess what? I have to drive a car when I take those medications. I have to go to work when I take those medications. I have to live when I take those pharmaceuticals every day, all day. It doesn't stop. So my question is, how come it can be that if we have to use medical marijuana, we can't be using it before we go to work? We can't be using it in situations that people don't think is right. Because when a per person medically uses cannabinoids, it does not get you high. If they're using it right, if they're using the right doses, you get to a point where your tolerance is built up to where it does not really get you high. It does what it's going to do, whether it's fighting chronic pain. We did find for people with chronic pain, we have to use higher doses of THC to fight the pain if they're basically dealing with like back pain or something like that. But through the dosing and the way that the human body builds a tolerance up to cannabinoids, it is nothing to get somebody up over a 100 milligram dose of THC and them not even feeling it and completely forgetting that they've taken that 100 milligram dose of THC. They don't even know. And it's just the way that it works. So we try to get people to understand. Everybody has an endocannabinoid system. Cannabinoids are very good for people. The U.S. government in 1930s basically took the prohibition forces that they had against alcohol and turned them completely against cannabis overnight with no reasoning. They have no proof. And the thing that makes it worse, the U.S. government researched the cannabis plant in the 1970s in a Mississippi facility that basically they know its capabilities, they have patents that the FDA got issued for CBD technology in the early 80s after they studied the plant. Basically, the U.S. government understands it very well. They have too many ties in the pharmaceutical industry, in basically the petroleum industry, in, in what we call for-profit prison. The problem in the United States is our prisons are ran as factories and they manufacture goods. So they like to arrest cannabis people because we're very mellow people. We are not violent people. So they basically will arrest cannabis people and put us in prison as opposed to violent people because of the fact that the prison in the United States are used to be basically manufacturing facilities that are ran for profit. And we talk about that. And the fact that to get cannabis legalized in the United States, you have alcohol, you have tobacco, you have for-profit prison, you have big pharma, you have a lot of big industries that you have to fight to get that plant legalized. And the question is whether they'll ever do it or not. I don't know. I've got to say, man, you are, in my eyes, truly a living. <clears throat> and, like, I've just been sat listening yeah. to you. Hey, I haven't even started talking yet, my friend. I haven't even started talking yet. Honestly, I can talk so much about every subject. Honestly, I can. And here's the other thing. I quit drinking in 1985. I was a total drug. Uh, I did nothing until 1985 but sold drugs. Mm -hmm. I had very good connection. I was a raging alcoholic. I had my senior skip day party. We had 17 16 gallon kegs at my senior skip day party. 600 out of 900 kids in my class skipped that day, and they knew that I threw the party. And basically, my school, my high school tried three different times to get me into treatment. 
but I was not on board for that at all. I was having too much fun, and my parents tried to get me in treatment. That didn't fly. And basically one day, 1985, I had been snorting cocaine. I'd gotten off work. I was in the bar drinking. My boss was sitting right next to me. He looks me right in the eye, and he says, Moon, if you would get your shit together, he said, you'll go somewhere with your life. And that's all it took. Walked over to the pay phone. I called my mom. I said, come pick me up. I'm ready. And I admitted myself to treatment that night. And that was April uh, 14th, 1985. And basically, I have not drank a drop of alcohol since that point in time. Um, cocaine, I only smoke cannabis. I will consume psilocybin mushrooms. We did legalize psilocybin mushrooms in Colorado. I can talk for hours about psilocybin mushrooms and medicinal qualities with psilocybin and with the microdosing and things that we have already found in the United States with psilocybin, with mescaline, with all the fun things that nobody wants to talk about and all those natural drugs that we know will help us but the government doesn't want us to use. A hundred, again, you're living proof of everything you say, like with the government's whole, especially America, I've learned a lot the past like from friends about how, and when you really look at it, it's such a chaotic kind of capitalistic driven it's just a cesspool of just using people and making it it's it's baffling you know i mean in england we have our problems as well but when you see tree so open about it like america it, it it baffles me but i'm so glad there are people like you i'll be honest i'm glad to be in thailand honestly it's funny because when i go on like if i go online on instagram and i talk on people's posts i've had people tell me you move out of the United States, you better not vote absentee here, you blah, 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 traitor, ha, 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 ha. It's, it's crazy. I, I, honestly, I lived in the United States my whole life. I was always a proud American, but I was proud to leave. I honestly was proud to leave when I left in April. It is not good. It is not good. Yeah, it's not at all. Enough. And I won't even start talking about what made it better. It was a big orange turd that did it. <laughs> <laughs> we can let the listeners guess who we're talking about there. You know, I'm not a Trump fan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so, but like I said, you know, I don't know. Did I fill enough time for you? Or? Bro, like you've done amazing. Glory alone. It means a lot, to especially you talk about this kind of stuff. Because, again, I'm young and... People, when they like listen to me, they're like, well, he's not really had life experience and blah, blah, blah. And I try and talk about these things. I can kind of cover them a little bit. But when I have someone like you, in again, like a flower-powered living legend, like covering all the stuff that I strongly believe in, it means a lot, like massive. Well, you know, I tell everybody, you know, I sold so many tie sticks in the 70s. Honestly, I had such a good connection. The tie sticks were amazing. I loved them. That's why when I see tie sticks, it just... Brings me back. I'm just like, you know, I grew. Think about the whole '70s. All we smoked was land race sativas. You know, there was no hybrids in the '70s. We didn't start hybridization until the early '80s. You know, that's when everything started getting crossed. But up until that point, everything we were smoking was true Panama Red. The Colombian Gold was amazing. You know, and if if the cartels. Whether it was the Mexican, the Colombian, the Central American cartels would have taken a little more pride in the cannabis that they were growing back in that time. This stuff would have been just amazing. You know, and it was good, but the tie was always so much better. And, you know, it was like I was talking about in the post. I don't think I ever one time found a seed in a tie stick. And I sold lots and lots of tie stick. And I always told everybody, you find any seed, and people always knew back in the 70s if they found seed in anything like hawaiian or good thai they always saved them seeds for somebody that grew so it was always in people's minds that if they found seed in that just outstanding stuff that we were smoking back then it always got saved nobody ever, ever had seed out of thai there was never any seed that came out of thai stick or anything like that even in the 80s when we were getting what we were calling that loose chocolate thai in california you never found seed in that stuff ever ever you know, so that's the first thing I look at, too, though, is, you know, we know how much energy developing the seed in the plant takes away from everything in the plant, whether it's the trichomes to the terpenes. It does. It saps that plant to produce those seeds. And I think that would be just even one main thing if a lot of the land race that I see, like the tie sticks that I see coming out of Thailand this year, 
if they could do a lot better job of make sure that they're calling those male plants out of there. And that's what Lorenzo is trying to do. And, you know, the group up there to the north is to get the farmers to understand that, you know, it just takes a little more attention to what they're doing and call those male plants out and a little better harvesting techniques and curing. And we know we can get those farmers up there to the north producing tie sticks again that the world's going to want. Because I'm a firm believer, a tie stick is something in people's lore, it's in legend, it's in history, and when people see it, they will want it. They will want it. I don't care. Even if young can talk all their crap about Thai genetics or crap, why do you smoke Thai, blah, 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 blah. I, I'm a firm believer. We bring Thai sticks out to the international market, and we have them on a good quality scale. People will want them, and Thai sticks will sell. A hundred percent. I think gets to the levitation. Thai stick is going to become a commodity. It's going to be a rebirth. Because I think it's not even just like your era kind of smokers. Even me, when a little bit of a backpacking boy going around, like that's that was the weed I remember. Like being up off when I first saw that little bund with a red string wrapped around it. That's a memory I remember so so well. And like that's what I'm excited to see come back. So am I. That's why. That's like I said. That's why I'm excited to help Lorenzo. You know, and basically work with those ganja farmers up there, and you know, get them so that they've got some better practices. And I made a comment about it the other day. You know, somebody had said those tie sticks you see nowadays are they the quality of what you saw back in the seventies? And I said, you guys gotta think of it this way: when they were producing tie sticks here in Thailand in the seventies, they had been growing ganja for the U- U.S. forces. For almost a decade at that point, and the ganja farmers were dialed in in Thailand with what they were doing at that time because of what they were supplying to the U.S. forces. And by the time they were rolling Thai sticks in the 70s, they were, like I said, they were at the top of their game because what they had been doing to supply all that beautiful ganja to the U.S. forces and stuff. And we all know that that's there in history. You know, we don't like to talk about Vietnam. It's something that I watched when I was a kid growing up. And, you know, it's not something we like to, to talk about, but it's there. It's part of the history that will never go away. And, you know, that's the thing that kind of intrigues me when I come here to Thailand because I look at these buildings. And these buildings bring me back to my childhood when I was watching the nightly news. And we watched Vietnam more every night on the news. You had to because that's all it was on. And our parents had the TVs on. And I remember seeing these buildings the whole time when we were watching you know, all those war scenes. So when I sit here and look out my windows and everything I see when I start talking to Lorenzo and up there in the Mekong region and stuff, and it just, there's a lot of people my age and it still brings a lot of back to us and memory and stuff like that. So, and, you know, we always remember that the U.S. soldiers used to come back to the U.S. talking about Thailand. And, you know, they always used to come to Thailand for R&R. And, you know, they were over here smoking the bud and, you know, doing what whatever they were doing, you know, we don't need to talk about it, but, <laughs> but I, I'll shut up now, I'll shut up, so, <laughs> there's, no, there's no need to shut up, man, you're doing amazing, this, this is the easiest interview I've ever had to do, I think you're so much on my wavelength, and you're so happy talking, it's it's brilliant to listen, because, again, I've had a lot of younger podcasts, well, see, I was, and, like, to have your perspective was, is really incredible, well, see, I, I've done a couple podcasts, I've done the, the Dude Grows show and stuff like that, and I was just telling a friend, I said, the thing with a podcast, is, I said, people can bring energy to a podcast. And I said, when you can bring energy to a podcast, I said, that kind of makes people want to watch it too then. So they're real intrigued. And the thing is, when I came to Thailand, I do still, and I have the ambition, I want to do a weekly podcast. I'm going to call it Thai Stick. And I want to talk about the cannabis industry in Thailand. Because believe me, I could fill two hours right now with you on the, the cannabis industry in Thailand. And what I've seen in two months that I've been here, because, you know, I, my farm is right up above Blow or Deodora Blow, Thailand, the lounge. And that's where I'm at right now. I'm sitting right in, in the Blow Lounge doing this podcast. So I'm upstairs in this whole building. I got a four-story hotel. And I'm the only person that lives in it. And I'm setting the farm up in it. Basically, I have the whole floor, the whole top floor done already. I just don't have big enough plants to run yet. <laughs> so I got I got three prime rooms ready to flower right now, and I got no plants to flower. <laughs> so I'm like a car without gas. Man. Like I'm sitting here in Thailand, but I'll be honest with you, because of that fact, Lorenzo sent me a whole big thing, and I, I've gotten a bunch of Thailand race from Lorenzo. And I'll be honest, I've been in Thailand now almost two months, and I have smoked nothing but Thailand since I've gotten here. 
And I love it. I love it. That stuff is amazing. It's, you know, when you look at it, it, yeah, it doesn't look all pretty. It's not all called trichome. It doesn't smell all beautiful. But I'll tell you, when you put fire to that stuff and you start smoking it, it's hard to explain to people. As you get down into the joint, and here's where it hits on a memory where I always have been talking about lately. Back in the 70s and 80s, everybody always saved their roaches. And you saved your roaches, and you rolled big joints with your roaches. This land race tie is you smoke a joint, and it loads up. When you get down into that thing, it just hits so hard every two, like one, boom, boom, woo, yeah. And it makes me remember why people used to save their roaches back in the day. Because that land race is, you're smoking that, and that's loading that joint up. Especially, here's the other thing, here in Thailand. I had to learn how to roll with these king size slim papers because <laughs> yep. that's how everybody has here. So I roll these joints with these king size slim papers that are like a mile long. And by the time you get a half mile down into that joint, that thing's kicking your booty around the block all day long. <laughs> <laughs> 100%, so I love the Thailand race. Honestly, that's all I've been smoking since I got here. Every once in a while, somebody will share some hybrid with me and stuff like that, which, you know, I miss smoking some hybrid. But I'll be honest, that Thai land race, I am so happy smoking that stuff every day, all day long. Because I've got a nice variety that Lorenzo sent me. So, you know, I'm smoking something different all through the day. Okay? But I always tell everybody, it all is about the right bush at the right time. And if you're using the right cannabis at the right time of day, it medicinally will work for you. You do not wake up first thing in the morning and start smoking indica. Because it will give you heavy eyelids. And the second you have that heavy eyelid feeling, people see you, they think you're stoned right away. So the first thing you don't want is heavy eyelids at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I'm the first one to say, why do people smoke in the morning? I don't understand that. Start out smoking your sativas in the morning, go to something a little lighter in the afternoon with some hybrids, and then in the evening, go to the indica. When you want to basically go to sleep, start hitting your indicas 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. And that has to do, like I said, it's all about the right boy at the right time. And there's a lot to that if you're going to medicinally use cannabis. I, I agree, completely agree. I mean, like, especially with Thailand, the availability, you can like, kind of look at it like, especially in Europe and America, it's very, very hybrid dominate. And, you know, a lot of the time you'll see the hybrid indica dominant, but, you know, not as to me as effective as the land race pure sativas and you know you get that effect so much more condensed in these land races that again you can't really explain it to you. it's kind of like a it's an experience no you can't <laughs> well that's what i say so i'm making some mct oil right now with the land race because i always made oil in the united states with venture based glycerin i'm one where i take oil every day under the tongue and typically i make oil I do two different infusions because here's another thing I can talk about with the endocannabinoid system. Most people never ingest THCA or CBDA. Because of the way that we consume cannabis, it's always converted. It's always converted to THC through the smoking process, through the edibles process. They never, ever ingest THCA and THCA is the cannabinoid that will fight headaches, but nobody ever gets it. So, I make my oil with two different infusions. Right now, it's being decarbonized, so basically the cannabinoids are activated. So the THC and a little bit of CBD that's in there is going to be activated. And then basically my second infusion now, I will do dark. And basically I strain, then I put in more land race, and I'll do another 30-day infusion, but I will not let the oil, I'll keep it in a cool spot, never put it in the sun, because the sun heating that oil up will actually activate those cannabinoids. So by keeping it in a dark, dark, cool spot, I will keep my THCA and my CBDA in place so that I will have what's called a true full-spectrum oil attack. And that is what we know, the true full-spectrums with all the cannabinoids THCA, CBDA, the THC, the CBD, and hopefully if we can get some CBGs in there, because that's another one. CBG, remember how I was talking about how THC will connect to your CB1 receptor. Yeah. 
CBDs will connect CBD2 receptor. CBG connects to both receptors. So CBG creates the entourage effect itself. CBG is actually probably one of the best cannabinoids that the plant carries it really is I, i'm legit sat here ha- having to make notes because like i'm like it, like i love listening to you as well but i'm also like i need to keep this wisdom i need to like it's like uh, you're full of knowledge and i it's ridiculously appreciated because i feel like i could honestly throw any topic so yes, at you think about cbg then will connect to both receptors and you know if you think about your cbd your cb receptors in your brain cb1 cb2 with creating a circuit and how that then creates a circuit in your endocannabinoid system with those cannabinoids, the CBG does that automatically itself to where you don't need THC and CBD. And that's another way when people don't want to get high that you can fight with cannabinoids and not get people high. Yeah, that seems a lot of something here, I'll, here, I'm like thinking here, on alone. Here's one. Now. Here, I'll get you thinking on this subject. Here's some fire for you. My friend Michelle Ross right now, Here's what she's helping with. And here's where people get really irate. She's helping pregnant ladies use can- cannabinoids. Yeah, that's that's definitely a topic. Think about that one. Yeah. So can you cover that a little bit? Are you allowed to go into but, a little bit of detail about that? Well, you know, that's one too where if you're going to use, if, if you're going to have ladies using cannabinoids, typically we try to go with the decarb, you know, we don't want to decarb. So we would like to go with THCA and CBDA. Um, but pregnancy and cannabinoids, no, it's is one where I don't know enough about it to where I really would like to talk about that because it gets into a deep subject. I know the ladies are using it. It's not affecting the babies. There's just a whole nother thing. See, because of the fact the plant is still Schedule 1 in the United States, any of the researching that is being done there is private research. There's no government-issued research done on the plant yet. There's a lot of areas that we need deep research Pregnancy and cannabinoids is the other. And the fact that this myth about how cannabinoids are killing babies, I don't even want to, like I said, I don't want to go there because it just gets to be a, a viral fire topic. But yeah, it, needs to be, it needs to be addressed by the people that can do it correctly and not by me just thinking I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that completely. And I mean, it's an interesting topic even just bringing up. And I do hope that like these uh, private professionals uh delve deeper and do talk about it something i'm definitely they will they will and i think a lot of that just has to do with the government the u.s government taking it off that schedule one yeah you know getting it out because you know it's it's heroin actually oxycontin oxycontin in the united states is at a lower schedule than cannabis you know how many people oxycontin has killed in the united states in the last decade and it's scheduled it's scheduled too can you believe that but you know why that is they protected the pharmaceutical company and all the mo- millions and billions of dollars that they made while they killed Americans. Yeah, it's horrible. It, it's, that's why me and the doctor fought. Yeah. Why we fought? Because he wouldn't let me have cannabinoids, and I threw in his face that I wouldn't let him stick his opioids in my body either. So they don't like that. No, not at all. I mean, it's it's. See, here, here's another topic that we talked about the other day: people being honest with their mm. doc- doctors about their cannabis use and we have to break that mystique and the fact that people have to be able to speak with their their doctors about their cannabis use and their cannabinoid use and what they're doing it's a subject that needs to be dealt with too it's like i said there's just so many things that need to be talked about like that don't be afraid to talk to your doctor about cannabis they ain't gonna throw you in jail. They can't. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I, I think it needs to be done more. It's something that, uh, like, even only recently, I've been mentioning it to my doctor because I've realised, well, they can't really do anything, even in the UK. And the stigma needs to be broken between cannabis and medicine. That wall needs to be torn down because it's something that people yeah. don't see properly. And it's, it's funny. When I'm in the doctor and I'm talking to the nurses and I start talking CBDs, and we're, I'm in a room private with a nurse and so I start talking CBDs, they start listening to me. But it's funny because after a couple minutes, they look up like big brothers look and they'll be like, oh. they kind of come to and they're like, oh, okay, all right, yeah, thanks. And then, then they're off. They kind of come to the realization. They're like, I can't listen to you talk a lot. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It happen and it does when you start talking about cannabis in the hospitals. The nurses just, they freak out. 
<laughs> but I like that. I'm the first one that likes to crank it up and start them fires, man. It's like, ah <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you, I'll let you go. Wait, wait, when's the show gonna air? Uh, I was going to say, I'm going to do some editing tonight, and hopefully it'll be out tomorrow, so I'll let you know. And, yeah, man, it's been, like, honestly all to you, like, truly. And, like, I hope you make a podcast called Tie Stick. Like, that's an amazing idea. If you need any help with from me or the network, know I'm here to help you. And, like, I'm excited for everything you're doing, man. It's been an honor. I, again, I, I'm very, I sound very respectful and simpy right now, but it's been an very meaningful for me for someone who understands your story for to have you on the podcast and share it with the listeners well, my my whole story is on we published it in weed world magazine that story i told you tonight was published in weed world magazine back in 2017 i've done five articles for weed world so i talk extensively about the cannabis industry in the united states and the horrible corporate cannabis crap and what's created california has happened and just I talk about it all, what's happened with the concentrates and how the young people won't flower no more in the United States, and it just goes on and on and on. I talk for days. Like I say, if you want to do another podcast, you sent over 10 good subjects, but I probably, I, you know, you can see now how long it would take me to address those 10 subjects, because I would love to address those 10 subjects you sent me, but it would just take me way too long. A hundred, yeah, I feel you. A hundred percent, we're gonna definitely have to have you on again. I think it'll become a recurring segment, marijuana with moon or something. We'll, we'll think of something that we could do to incorporate you, man. I, I, I'm hip. I'm all hip. Uh, I, like, I always like to talk, and I'm in a good situation. I'm in. Basically, like I said, I'm here at the cannabis lounge all day. I my farm. I come down to the cannabis lounge. I light up big joints and sit down here and just smoke joints all night long. So I'm in a good, I, I, hey, I love where I'm at right now. People are like, why you come to Thailand? And here's the thing, I tell everybody, I get paid Thai wages. I make 10,000 baht a month is what I get paid. And I tell everybody, when you live in Thailand, Thailand ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. But the only thing that saves me is I don't have to pay rent. Yeah. So I live, I have in this full story hotel that basically is mine, that I don't pay rent, I don't pay electricity. I built the farm, you know, I've got my plants going, we're going to start flowering here pretty quick. So, no, I'm happy, I'm loving Thailand, honestly, I love being here, <laughs> it's, I love it. I'm yeah. really glad, man, that's what I love to hear, and I'll definitely, like, after my Chiang Mai trip, I'm definitely going to plan to come in and see you and come check out the, the farm, hopefully you'll have some uh, plants finally uh, ready to go in it, but yeah, I'm really excited. Oh yeah, no, I got already cranked up, so, heck yeah, I'll be excited to come down, that'll be fun. Heck yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. And, and thank right. you again. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk.